It's amazing to me that when we hear the name Franklin Delano Roosevelt, we should immediately think China. It was one of the major influences in, in young FDR's life. His mother, Sarah Delano Roosevelt, grew up in a mansion in Hong Kong. Sarah Delano Roosevelt was the one who paid Franklin's bills. Franklin Roosevelt never had uh, any big high paying jobs. He was a public servant most of his life. But he had yachts, he had townhouses in New York, summer place up in Maine. Where did that money come from? It came from the Delano line. Where did the Delanos get the money? Grandpa Warren Delano was the American opium king of China. He was the biggest American opium dealer. So it's as if the Cali cartel shoving cocaine into the United States grew a president of, of Colombia. Now, people are surprised Warren Delano was an opium dealer, a, a criminal in the eyes of, of, the, of the Chinese. And some people think this is just a little slice of, an unusual slice of history that I've picked out, but it isn't. If you, if you go all over the East Coast, you'll see the influence of opium fortunes. Look at, go to the campus at Yale University. The, uh, the, the tomb, which is the headquarters for the Skull and Bones Society, is on the campus of Yale University. That tomb is still financially supported by the Russell Trust. Warren Delano worked for the Russell family. It was the Russell company that he worked for, the biggest opium dealers in China. This is, Yale is built on land uh, donated by uh, opium barons. The number one most famous building on Columbia's campus is the Lowe Library. That's named after Abbott Lowe, who dealt opium with Warren Delano out there in China. Princeton University's first big, big benefactor was Stephen Green. Stephen Green took over Russell and Company's opium operations after Warren Delano returned back to the United States a rich man. America's first manufacturing city, Lowell, Lowell, Massachusetts, was founded by opium money. The first railroads in the East Coast, opium money. Uh, Ralph Waldo M. Emerson, the great transcendentalist, how come he had so much time to sit around and think? Because he married into an opium fortune. The Council on Foreign Relations, the Coolidge family, opium. Chiquita Banana, AT&T. Scratch the history of anybody with the name Forbes in their name, like Secretary of State John Forbes Carey, and you'll see an opium fortune. His great-grandfather was an opium dealer. So, you know, when the Chinese talk about 100 years of humi humiliation, this is what they're talking about. We were shoving opium uh, under the uh, guys, uh, under the eyes of the British, French, and the United States navies, Warren Delano was counsel out there in Canton and welcomed the first navy ships, U.S. navy ships, to participate in the first opium war. Roosevelt said to cut off oil to Japan would precipitate war in the Pacific. The United States will not shut off oil to Japan and thereby force her into a military expedition against Indonesia. There was no Indonesia at that time. It was called the Dutch East Indies, but I just changed the name to bring it up to date. So FDR said, hey, you cut off oil, the United States is going to have a war in the, in the Pacific. We're going to get involved. I don't want a war in the Pacific. I have a Europe first policy. I want to help Winston Churchill confront um, Hitler in Europe. And to do that, I have to keep peace in the Pacific because I'm withdrawing my military resources out of the Pacific. And there will never be a war in the Pacific if I continue to supply Japan with oil. Japan was buying 80% of their oil from the United States at that point. And Roosevelt knew there would be no war if he kept that tap open because the Japanese were dependent on it. The State Department agreed with him. They said, if you cut off Japan's oil, Japan will go down to Indonesia, and America will be involved in a war. Well, as I said, 75% of um, the American public is bamboozled into this idea that you can easily cut Japan's oil with no blowback. And now again, 
the, the, what they were focused on, the argument with Japan wasn't over silk or cotton or anything. It was about China. For generations, we had been dreaming about the rise of new China, Christianized, and it will happen if we just get the Japanese off the Chinese back by cutting the oil. So in July of 1941, Roosevelt is about to disappear from the United States, but he doesn't tell the public why. He's going to go up to Canada to meet Winston Churchill in what later will be called the Atlantic Conference. Churchill's at war. There's wartime secrecy. We're not at war. But Roosevelt is about to go to Canada. He's about to leave. And you'll see in the book that there were rock and roll cabinet meetings where his cabinet members were arguing with him that it's immoral to keep selling Japan oil. And Roosevelt, the brilliant politician, knew that 75% of the public was against him on this. So he makes a final appeal to the United to Americans. He stands up at Hyde Park, and Roosevelt makes a speech. And FDR says to uh, Americans, you might ask, why are we selling Japan oil, helping Japan in what looks like an act of aggression? Well, Japan doesn't have oil of their own. If we had cut their oil off, they probably would have gone down to Indonesia a year ago, and you would have had war. Therefore, there is a method in letting oil go to Japan with the hope, and it's worked for two years, of keeping war out of the South Pacific. Here you have Franklin Roosevelt saying, I have kept the peace in the Pacific for two years. We can continue to have a, a peace, no war in the Pacific, but you got to keep the oil spigot open. He thinks he's made his case, and then he gets on the presidential yacht. People on shore off the coast of Connecticut see the president waving to them goodbye. He's going off on a 10-day fishing trip, but that's not the president. It's a double. The Secret Service had put Roosevelt on a destroyer and ran him up uh, to Canada. Now, it's August of 1941. The big cat is away, and the China lobby influenced mice within Roosevelt's administration decide to play. The first wise man, Secretary of War Stimson, says Japan would never attack the United States. The number two wise man, Assistant Secretary of State Dean Acheson, says no rational Japanese would ever attack the United States. And these guys with some other Confederates you'll see in the book cut Japan's oil. Now they do it three, four levels down from FDR. FDR at his, you know, he's up in Canada, the Secretary of State is in uh, West Virginia, much of Washington is gone, it's August 1941, no air conditioning, Roosevelt's out of the country, nobody knows where he is, you know, a lot of things came together here. And Roosevelt can see that the State Department is continuing to approve oil to Japan. But three, four levels down below those approvals, these uh, Washington wise men geniuses do the moral thing, they think, and they cut Japan's oil. You know what, folks? I got a degree in East Asian studies many years ago. I didn't know till I researched this book that the president of the United States did not know for 30 days that Japan's oil had been cut. One month went by. Now, this isn't a small thing. The number one thing Roosevelt said would make a war in the Pacific is cutting Japan's oil. That number one thing had been done, and the president of the United States did not know for one month. Well, so we cut Japan's oil, and guess what? In Japan, their leader's hair was on fire. The advisors to Hirohito said, Japan is going to be an industrialized beach whale. We don't want to fight the United States, but we don't have a chance here. I mean, we don't have a choice here. We have to go strike out. No oil, no Japan. We've got to go south to Indonesia. And the plan was to hit Pearl Harbor as a sideshow. You know, some Americans think of Pearl Harbor as the invasion of the United States. It wasn't. Japan could have taken Hawaii in about two minutes. They didn't want to invade the United States. They just wanted to hit the Navy to stop it from interfering with their thrust for the precious oil 
that they had to go get now because the wise men cut the supply. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt is up in Canada singing Onward Christian Soldiers with, uh, with uh, Winston Churchill. They're, plan they're making detailed plans for war across the Atlantic. They're not discussing the Pacific because Roosevelt said to Churchill, don't worry, there will be no war with Japan. I'm feeding them oil. They will never attack us. Roosevelt didn't know that he had been stabbed in the back by these China lobby believing administration officials who continued to propagandize that uh, American and Chinese interests were aligned and, and uh, you can help China by cutting that Japanese oil. So guess what the Japanese did? They did exactly what Franklin Delano Roosevelt had anticipated. They went south for oil in Indonesia, which involved us in a Pacific war, a preventable war. Yes, my dad raised the flag in Iwo Jima. Yes, I learn now my father was involved in a war that Franklin Roosevelt had prevented for two years and was sure would never happen if he was allowed to keep that oil open. So I agree with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. World War II in the Pacific was an entirely preventable war. So now we get into World War II. And, oh, you know, I wanted to talk about this. You know, American school children are being uh, told that the United States went into World War II to help Winston Churchill defend democracy against Hitler. And I don't know when that happened. December 8th, we declare war on Japan. December 9th, Churchill's begging us to get involved in Europe. No, 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 we're not, no. December 10th, no, no, we're not declaring war on him. It wasn't until Hitler rashly declared war on us that we got involved in Europe. World War II came to the United States from Asia, and it came to the United States from Asia because we were looking at that China mirage. 